Okay, microphone's working. Very good. I'm not sure. Never sure which way that switch goes. Greetings, saints. There you go. Don't back away from that one. That's a given position. It's something that we have the privilege of living in and living up to. Our opening scripture this morning is from Revelation 22, verse 16. Stand with me, please, while we read this, if it's comfortable for you. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you have sent us and you go with us in all things, in all places, at all times. Thank you, Jesus, that it's you who has made us the light of the world. And it's you, Lord, who walks with us in that light because you are that very light. Much to see of you today in these last couple of chapters of this great book of Revelation. Bless, Lord, I pray, our understanding that we might know and have courage in all things. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, the opening hymn this morning is My Jesus, I Love Thee, number 134 in our hymn books. Okay, the end of the book. We're at the end of the book. We haven't rushed. We've seen all sorts of things from Genesis to Revelation that God is doing in his world. And today we're in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. No, let's start with verse 1. What am I doing? Yes, sorry. Missed a, missed a piece here. Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was, all, there was also no more sea. A new heaven and a new earth. Interesting. The last um, we will see of the old earth is where we reign with Christ for a thousand years in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 8. Old Testament references to the new heaven and the new earth found in Isaiah, way back in the book of Isaiah, in the chapter um, 65. Isaiah 65, verse 17. Oh, I did it again. There is no Isaiah 65. <laughs> Isaiah, why am I looking in Jeremiah? My goodness. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm always suspect of that. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 13. I simply visit these verses to show you that God's will is prevailing through the generations. Second Peter Chapter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So Revelation 21, verse 2, a new heaven and a new earth. Perfect. Ken, has this thing got a bit of a ring in it today? This microphone? Is it... Not ringing? All right. I will ignore it. Oh, there you go. Okay. 
Verse 2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And this can also be found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, when Jesus is speaking to the church at Philadelphia. And he says to them, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, and I will write on him my new name. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27, reads as, reads as follows, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, that's the church, the bride of Christ, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. We see here in Revelation 21, verse 2, that he is, she has prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Moving, moving along, Revelation 21, verses 3, and 3 to 5. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Verse 5, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. God will wipe away every tear. I love that. No more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor pain. There's nothing in the, heaven, in, in the new heaven and the new earth that will give one reason to cry. In fact, that there is no, the fact that there is no more dying eliminates the need for grieving and crying. No more pain is not a temporary relief like we might get now for our troubles. It's not a temporary relief, but pain, it's an eternal absence of it. An eternal absence of pain. Wow. Heartache, everything else, gone. I like that. Waiting for that. Amen? Anybody? Yeah, I know. Behold, I make all things new. These last two chapters take us back to what it was like in the Garden of Eden before the fall. Before we go any further, let's consider the timeline for a moment. In Revelation 20, following the Battle of Armageddon, the beast and the false prophet were captured and thrown into the lake of fire. The dragon, the serpent of old, the devil, is thrown into the bottomless pit and sealed up for a thousand years. During this time, the saved will reign with Christ on the earth. After a thousand years, he will be released. He will deceive and gather many people, doing the same stuff he did before he got thrown into the pit, gather people and surround the saints in Jerusalem. God will come, come down, fire will come down from God and destroy them. The devil will be thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. So that's just the timeline. Okay, so now the new heaven and the new earth. And let me just show you something. I found this fascinating. Reading from verse 6 to 16. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven plagues, seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit into a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her light was like, the, like a most precious stone like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. 
Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. The names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And, the measure, and it measured the city, and he measured the city, sorry, with the reed. 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. Come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Now remember, in the Jewish tradition, when we looked at that, what happens there, it's not how wonderful the bride looks at the wedding, it's how wonderful the groom looks for how wonderful he makes the bride look. Remember when he takes the bride price? Are you worthy to be the husband of, of, of my daughter and, and the one who gives much? This is what we've just seen. The bride of Christ. All of this is him preparing us for this glorious place that he describes. All glory to God for his great work. In verse 10, Go back to verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. This is what the bridegroom has prepared for his bride. This is what Jesus was referring to in John 14, verses 1, 1 and 2. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you again unto myself. Such a place. Seriously. He has not only prepared a place for us, he has also prepared us, his church, for this place. Gotten us ready. And we stay ready. And we wait. We don't know when the bridegroom is going to return, but he has returned. He will return. So in verse 16, I just did a little bit of research, found this quite amazing. Verse 16, 12,000 furlongs. My, my research it tells me that a furlong is 202 yards. So 12,000 furlongs is 1,500 miles. The square footage of New Jerusalem is 2,250,000 square miles. And that's just the flat. And it's 1,500 miles high. Are you serious? So then I, I look a bit further and I thought, it's not going to fit on the earth not on the one that we have now it is roughly 62 miles from the earth's surface to outer space the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God is 1500 miles high this obviously can't work unless we're looking at something we have never seen before a new heaven and a new earth we haven't even been able to see the end of the universe yet we send out spaceships to look even further, and still we can't see the end. Six days. It took him six days. He can't make a new heaven and a new earth? In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Verse 21, uh, chapter 21, sorry. Um, verses 21 to 27. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold. Transparent, like transparent glass. You probably all heard this story, but there was a man that lived for his gold. He did so his whole life. When he died, he met St. Peter at those gates, at the pretty gates. He brought a wheelbarrow full of gold with him. Peter said, welcome. Looked at the wheelbarrow and said, just curious, but why did you bring a wheelbarrow full of asphalt here? Yeah, the things that we treasure compared to 
who God is and the glory that he brings into our lives. The things that we worship, even. And, and that would be the danger, except for this is going to be a place where no more of that nonsense is going on. But to live in such a place like that without worshiping all of the jewelry and all of the, the magnificence of it, and because we, there we'll be worshiping Jesus, who will bring more to us than all of that could ever add. And so we have to ask ourselves, why do you want to go to heaven? When you read it like this, well, I want to see that place. If that's your first remark, you're going there for the wrong reason. And you probably won't make it. It's all about Jesus and him being everything to us in all, at all times, in every place. Revelation 22, the first couple of verses, he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its streets and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each fruit yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There you go, Wally. There's the healing of the nations in that, in that tree. But you'll never see that tree if we're celebrating ourselves. We'll never see that tree. If we're celebrating our rights and all of these things. I mean, where is it? It brings back to me that simple phrase that Jesus said, he who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake and the gospels will find it. He wasn't just messing around with words. What are we laying down? Are we taking our wheelbarrow full of asphalt? Sometimes. So as it turns out, the book of the Bible ends up where it began. Back in Genesis. Only everything done properly this time. This time, we, we leave the knowledge of good and evil with God and feast on while we rest, as it were, under the tree of life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life and also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Revelation 22, 13 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. As we go along, as things get better because Christ is in charge of our life, don't look at the things that are getting better. Don't start putting your strength in how well you're doing or, or any of that kind of stuff. You've got to stay in your foundation as you go from that foundation. It never gets disconnected. It never gets disconnected because we end up at where we begin. And where, where we should always begin is Jesus. It's the only place to start. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Good. Start with that and stick with that. And we'll end up where we should be. And so, yeah, we end up, well, did we accomplish anything? Oh, huge. Way more than we did without Christ, that's for sure. In Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 to 7. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor, or, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of, the, of this prophecy and of this book. Jesus mentions this three times within the next 15 verses that he's coming quickly to stay ready, to stay ready. This angel is what we do when 
when you look at the seven letters to the seven churches, it talks about the angel of this church and the angel of that church. That's people who take up leadership in a church. That's who they are. He calls them angels. Why? They're delivering God's message all the time. Now, this will be a hard sell for you, but I'm included in that. As many of you are. But it's still all about God. And the only way you can do what God calls you to do is to do it with him. Otherwise, you won't succeed. You can't do it without him. He didn't call you to go, go do something for him. He, he's like a father. He, he says, come on, let's take a walk. I want to do something with you. Come on, come with me. I want to show you something. I want to show you this. I want to show you that. And so that you live your Christian life awestruck. Awestruck. When's the last time you were awestruck? You know, we keep looking for this asphalt to make us awestruck. Not going to do it. Jesus will do it. He'll make you awestruck and keep you awestruck. We do things with Jesus. Revelation 22, verses 8 to 21. Then I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your, your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God! Wow. There's a guy. <laughs> angel, there's a guy who's not about himself. He wasn't building something for God. He wasn't building a ministry. He wasn't trying to sustain a church. He wasn't doing any of that. He was just a messenger from God, and that's all that mattered. And so when, when John was like ready to fall at his feet, he says, John, I'm not doing anything more than you're doing. And the only reason both of us are able to do it is because Jesus lives within us, and he's doing the work. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Now, can you keep yourself there? That's what we do. Can you keep yourself there? I, I like to put it this way. Abide under the shadow of the Almighty, but don't get under his feet. Don't be like a cat that you're always stepping on. Always bothering and nattering. And don't do that. Abide under his shadow, but don't get under his feet. Stay close. But don't be adding your two cents worth in something or crossing the path or going someplace else. Stay faithful in Jesus and to Jesus. And said, so he said, worship God. Verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. There's more to do yet. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He was filthy, let him be filthy still. He who was righteous, let him be righteous still. He who was holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. Like I said last week, we'll always get what we want. Be careful what you're going after. Be careful what you want. If you ask God, should, should I be wanting that, God? Should I be wanting that? And if he says no, drop it. Right now. Because if you insist on staying a different way, I'm coming quickly, whether you change or not. But if you don't change, you won't be with me. We can't stop the will of God. All we can do is choose to leave ourselves out of it. But you can't stop it. He is coming quickly. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. Wow. That's awesome. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. 
I am the root of the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And anyone who takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. In, in conclusion then, it's not what I am delivered from that makes heaven a beautiful place, but who I am being delivered to, that is Christ. It's not what I am being taken from, but who I am being taken to, it's Christ and Christ alone. Once we are joined to Christ, anything and everything we need is found in him. He is our life. He is what we need. As David said in Psalm 23, and Wally, you'll appreciate this, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Sell out to that one. Sell out to that one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. As a matter of fact, the rest of it, allow me just to take a few steps into that while, he, while he's preaching on the 23rd Psalm, so I don't want to, to um, preach over it. I'm not sure. I probably haven't reached anything close to what he's been sharing. But anyway, so the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. What does that mean? He forces me there, drives me there with dogs and makes me lie down? No. He fulfills me so much and I've eaten for so long that I just lie down and go to sleep in the pasture. He makes me, his presence makes me able to do that, to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Why? Because he knows I'm afraid to drink from waters that are running and making a lot of noise. He's careful about how he leads us. I, I had a, I don't know what it was, one night, I'd went, gone to bed, and just before I fell asleep, I had this vision, I guess. But it came in a, in a form of a feeling. I was a young believer, and I, I think God was just trying to show me what he had in store. And I had this feeling come over me that suddenly there was nothing else to do. I was finished. You know, in life, how there's always something next to do. No, I was finished. And I knew everything. I had no more questions. And I was not bored. Fascinating. I had a sense that it was what heaven was going to be like. Because I always had something to do. You always have something to worry about. You always have something to have to fix. You always have... No, it was all done. Finished. Wow. I remember that now at the end of this book. So, oh, I think there's one more. Oh, that's it. This is a good time and a good place to um, celebrate. Let's worship God. I'd ask you to join me in the benediction today. Just the last word, I'll call you out. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.